how would you describe the Bible, the biblical stories, the composition of the Bible, considering that a lot of it's not literal, there may be some historicity to it, but we can clearly see that there are astrotheological origins to some of the characters, some of the stories. Uh, could each of you answer that? Robert? Well, it's kind of a uh, mulligan stew. All sorts of things have been tossed into it, many of them which would not have been if people still understood them. So there is excavation to be done all over the text to see what the stories originally meant and what it meant for scribes or whoever to, uh, to reinterpret and rewrite them. And that gives you a kind of a, well, it's kind of like uh, Elon Musk uh, revealing all these Twitter things. You, you find out what was going on behind the scenes. And you can do that pretty darn well with the Bible and learn more than it wants to teach you. And uh, this is uh, inherently worthwhile, in my opinion, to know the truth about it, whether it's edifying or not. Uh, but the, the astrology, that is a, a that's exhibit A. There's, uh, you know, that was important to them. And some theologians have even seen that. Some conservatives have even, uh, there's a book, The Gospel in the Stars. Uh, but most just laugh it off. Even this book by Molina that I mentioned with astrology in the book of Revelation, uh, he uh, complained that no scholar even discussed this. They just gave it the cold shoulder, though it's a brilliant piece of biblical investigation. So uh, it tells us what it, uh, it tells us things that whoever originated the stories wanted us to know, though we have to reconstruct it. It tells us what others didn't want us to know and what they did to hide it. And, and those two uh, revelations are, are what gives us a kind of a Gnostic, deep understanding of the Bible. A lot of it is edifying and wise. So that's true. Anybody can see that. But there's so much more to it uh, that you, you have to... Uh, uh, dig to find and when you do it only enriches it it doesn't exactly debunk it like the people you were talking about before hey, hey don't ask those questions we don't want to uh we don't want to uh, upset the apple cart but if you don't you're not going to get the apples <laughs> yes yeah um in a similar vein you know i i, I started I started out as a, an agnostic uh, atheist looking at this story, so I don't really uh, have uh, any particular viewpoint which way it should go, and I wasn't quite sure which way it would go when I was looking at this material. But in my work, I've sort of proved to myself and to many of my followers that sort of 90% of it is historical so that most of these characters can be found in the historical record if you look for them, like looking for the Hyksos instead of, you know, the shepherd patriarchs, um, like looking for Jesus in Edessa and so on. All of these characters can be found in the historical record. Um, so I'm sort of now erring to the point of view that 90% of the Bible is actually historically true but just not in the fashion that it's normally taught. So you have to look at these people as being pharaohs of Egypt, kings of Edessa, important people, pharaohs of the uh, 21st dynasty over in Tanis, which we've not talked about, the uh, you know, King David and King Solomon. Um, so this is a record of this particular monarchy, because I think Jesus was linked to this particular monarchy as well. Um, well, even as you know, the Gospels say, you know, he was linked to David and Solomon. Um, and so it's, it's their history. And of course, their history would be following their religion, which was mainly the study of the cosmos above. That was the ancient tradition and history of 
uh, of Egypt. If you look at most of Egyptian theology, it's all to do with the heavens above. Um, and their explanation of, of how the heavens moved and so on. Um, and, and even things which are not um, commented much on, things like uh, a quick final screen share coming. Uh, so if I share this one. <clears throat> so this comes out of ancient Egypt, of course, the very beginnings of ancient Egypt. This is Nut and Geb. So Geb is the earth male god, and Nut is the uh, female goddess who arches her body across the sky, and the sun travels through her body from um, from sunset to sunrise. It travels through the body of Nut. So who is Nut? Well, she's quite obviously the Milky Way, and you can even see her arms and legs on both ends arching her body across the sky. She is the Milky Way. Um, this was their explanation of the heavens above. This is what they were doing. This was their uh, religion. This was their philosophy. This is what gave them power. Because if you have the power to predict things from the heavens above, like Joseph was doing to Pharaoh with his predictions, like um, predicting eclipses and things of that nature, you know, next week the sun will disappear behind the moon. <gasps> How did you know that? Mm, mm. Um, it gives people power. Mm. Um, plus, it is an explanation for, you know, uh, you know, God's involvement with, you know, with mankind, um, how he created or she created, perhaps. You never know nowadays the whole of the universe. Um, all of that sort of explanation is power to the people who have it. That's why they had these big zodiacs on the Sea of Galilee. It was power. You could instruct people on the movements of the heavens above by using these zodiacs. Um, and so I think this is, is, is real history. It's just been garbled a little bit with a few sort of, you know, Chinese whispers, um, telephone whispers or whatever they want to call it. And the story has got garbled and it's been used and abused and misused by various people who want to interpret it in various fashions, which are not historical. Um, but I think it's a history of this royal family. And the interesting thing, which we don't really have any information on, is what happened to that royal family after the Jewish revolt, when they were kicked out of Judea. Um, and then we go into the mythology of going to the south of France and all of that sort of business, which I sort of look at, but then you're really dependent on mythology because we don't really have any history of that. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it's the story of an Egyptian royal family that lasts for 2,000 years, I suppose, from the beginning of the uh, Hyksos period um, to, to the end of uh, Jesus would be 2,200 years of the history of this family. Uh, and then we lose sort of track of what happened to them after that. But um, yeah, I think it's real history. So, you know, the thing that sums up at least one of your emphases that I find really striking is that um, mythicists uh, argue that uh, you know if there was a person of such importance as we say Jesus was, why is he not attested outside the little circle of, of the New Testament? Uh, it's, uh, it can't be. And you're saying, well, you're right. Such a person would have gotten a lot more notice in history. And he did. You just don't seem to know where to look. I, I find that so helpful in understanding what you're doing. Yeah. And and we know that they were deleted from history uh, because I, I've said this before, but the, the classic example is from Josephus Flavius, um, where he details the battle of Aretas of Petra versus Antipas of Judea, where Josephus says that Aretas was helped by some fugitives from Syria. And you're thinking, hold on, Josephus, you, you know what's going on. Why will you not name these people, these fugitives from Syria? And then you read Moses of Corinne, and he says exactly the same story 
and he says that Aretas was joined by the army of the Edessan king. Uh -huh. So now we know who the fugitives are, and we also know that Josephus was deliberately covering up this family, this royal family, and not only covering them up by not naming them, but also denigrating them by calling them fugitives. Mm -hmm. Not just the unknown army, but fugitives from Syria. Mm -hmm. So we know that this family has been deleted from classical history. And I think they've been deleted, as it were, from biblical history as well, because Rome didn't want you to know anything about them, because this family had caused a, a revolt against Rome, uh, and it was, if you go along with the Roman provenance theory of people like, you know, um, uh, the, the chap you just mentioned. Jim um, uh, Valiant, uh, Valiant yeah, et cetera, who are all on, mm. uh, and Atwill and so on, who are all on the mm. Roman provenance uh, bandwagon, uh, dare I say. Um, and... If, if um, you place the story in that era, then, of course, Vespasian would not want anyone mentioning any, anything about this royal family. Mm. And if Josephus Flavius was involved in its composition, uh, as, again, the Roman provenance theory seems to uh, mention, then, of course, he would, n he would have been instructed not to mention this particular royal family which he doesn't in his secular books. We know that. You can go through the books. They're not mentioned once. And he wouldn't if he was involved in the composition of the uh, gospel story either. Um, they would be deleted from history. And mm. they were. They've been deleted from history. Because that was always the stumbling block. You know, when I first started this many eons ago, when I was fresh and young, 30 stroke, 35 years ago or whatever, um, I had this inkling, of course, that the Jesus character was a real king, because that's what he's called. But the question always was, how can you lose a real king from history? It's just not possible, is it? Well, now we know that there is a royal family that was deleted from history, and they were deleted deliberately. And that was the Adia Beni Edessan uh, monarchy who came from Odessa in northern Syria. And they have been deleted from history. And we know from all of the context of these stories that we've been talking about, that they were intimately involved somehow in this gospel story and the mm. Jewish revolt story as well. Mm. So here's that lost monarchy. Mm. You know, they, they've been rediscovered. Mm. Fascinating. Why? Wow. It's not only that there's new facts to learn, but they're like whole new ways of seeing the big picture that uh, that uh, meet us by surprise. Wow. Yeah, um, I mean that that is the the beauty, if I say myself, of this particular theory is that it's not one aspect in isolation. It's an entire thesis that covers all of the points within the gospel story. Uh, mm. All of the points that are mentioned within that story can be answered in an Edessan fashion, using mm. the information, the history we have of the Edessan monarchy. Uh, people might not like that, and I have lots of uh, detractors who say, no, you know, that's not how it happened. But they can be answered, all of those problems that exist within the uh, gospel story. And, you know, many of those things are problems because they just don't make sense. Uh, in the in the classical terms, suddenly they start to make sense. I mean, even, you know, the John the Baptist thing, we were just talking about King Aretas um, uh, having a battle with uh, Antipas. That was to do with John the Baptist. It was over uh, the divorcing of the daughter of Aretas. She was sent back home again. Aretas was upset. So he sent an army to go and punish uh, Antipas. Um, and that's why they had a battle. But there is a problem here with this battle. We know why Aretas was upset, because his daughter had been spurned. Mm. But why did the Edessans get involved? What was their bitch? Why did they want to punish Antipas? 
Well, the only other thing that happened at this time was John the Baptist got beheaded. So it seems likely that John the Baptist must have been a part of the Edessan royal family. Otherwise, the Edessans wouldn't have been down there in Judea trying to pun punish Herod Antipas. Hmm. Hmm. So Herod, sorry, John the Baptist must also have been linked to this Edessan monarchy. And so all of the links we have all point in the same direction. And mm. it explains what was going on. Whereas, mm. you know, in the traditional view, there is no explanation for a lot of these things. Yeah, if the alternative to a hypothesis is nothing, uh, <laughs> who gets the prize? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, at the very least, people have a lot of refuting to do um, mm. to overcome the many similarities and links that we get between these two. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's certainly something that's worth exploring. Even if people mm -hmm. don't like the theory, it's something that's mm -hmm. worth exploring mm -hmm. further because the more people mm -hmm. who look at it, the more information will drop out of the woodwork. So rather than dismissing it, people should be acknowledging it, looking at it, see if in, mm -hmm. seeing if perhaps they can falsify it, but also seeing if they can... Um, reinforce that theory mm -hmm. with other information that they have because they've mm -hmm. looked at other texts or whatever um it's you know with theories they have to be nurtured as well as being mm -hmm. knocked off their pedestal somebody has mm -hmm. to nurture these new theories because mm -hmm. you know you, you can't get all of the information out of just one source you know in a way, and new things pop up in light of uh, the, the new paradigm. Like it's altogether appropriate that a new proposed paradigm really has to run the gauntlet because <laughs> you have to prove its worth. Uh, and uh, one of, and the way one way you do that is to say, uh, well, look at this. We can make sense of this now. We couldn't under the old paradigm, but it's no longer anomalous data. Uh, if, if I'm right, this would explain this. Well, uh, that's one of the, the classic ways you, you verify a, a new paradigm. The old one, yep. I don't know what's going on there. Well, if this is right, we do know. And so a, a lot of the stuff, it, a lot of the controversy is just bias, I think. Yeah, I mean, it, it's like the arrival of the Hukuk mosaic, which I found was was very interesting because I drew a picture of my Edessan king on the front of my book, Jesus, King of Edessa. Mm. Uh, and then about four years later, they found the Hukuk mosaic. And lo and behold, here he was <laughs> sitting uh. on the Hukuk mosaic, exactly mm. the same as I put him on the front mm. of my book. So I knew exactly who this guy was. Mm. Um, but the archeologists had misidentified this character as being Alexander the Great. But of course he can't be Alexander the Great because he's wearing a Jewish piot. He's got a curly side lock of hair amongst other reasons. You know, he's got a full beard and so on, mustache, which, you know, uh, Alexander the Great never had. He was always clean shaven. Um, mm. And so here was, my uh, my thesis explaining who this character was. And yet this character was only discovered after my book had been written. And mm. yet they are identical. Mm -hmm. And so the, the character in the Hukuk mosaic was actually Bar Kamza from the Talmud. Mm -hmm. uh, but Bar Kamza was the leader of the Jewish revolt, according to the Talmud. Mm. And so we're coming back to the Jewish revolt and Roman provenance and all the rest of it. Uh, we're mm. back to the same era. Mm. So that was one small item that's come up ever since, you know, the book was written. And I'm sure other things can be discovered at later times. So we live in hope that there will be other mm. discoveries. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Well, this has sure been uh, informative for me. Well, yep, so I'm, I'm very glad about that. So, yes, mm -hmm. it's my pleasure. Mm -hmm.